please welcome to the stage Kenny Turan and Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you. Well, it's nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, when I first they gave me this assignment, I thought, I'm not going to have enough to ask. And the more I started rereading and looking at your books, now I'm afraid that I have too much to ask. So hopefully we'll have a medium between them. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you, the first story I, I was fascinated that I wanted to hear you talk about again. I know you're, you know, it's not always clear where ideas come from for stories, for books. But you tell a wonderful story about where the idea for Blink came from. And I wanted to start there. And, uh, yeah, no, uh, there, well, although I, always, I realize in retrospect, before I answer the question, that uh, when you think back on where an idea comes from, it usually comes from several places simultaneously. So one of the, one of the areas, the places where Blink came from, I grew my hair really long. I had it really short in the 90s, as one did. And then I grew it out. And... Uh, quite extravagantly, much more so than now. And um, I wasn't sure why, and, but, I, but I was, it was incredibly fascinating how uh, differently the world began to treat me just because I had long hair. Um, the, on the plus side, people thought suddenly that I was cool, which was <laughs> um, really quite an extraordinary development, if you know me. Um, <laughs> and, but on the downside, uh, I began to get you know, an unusual level of scrutiny from law enforcement. Huh. Um, so it was sort of, you had a situation where you're like, well, is it worth it? I mean, on the one hand, being cool, on the other hand, getting speeding tickets every, you know, wow. month. I, and my, my judgment was actually it was worth it. There's a very high price <laughs> I'm willing to pay for, for, uh, for people uh, uh, entertaining that um, illusion about me. Now, with David and Goliath, can you, the, the new book, which is what we're here kind of celebrating, where did, is there a way to piece together where that book came from? Well, that was, I gave a uh, uh, talk once at this conference, and I started chatting with this guy uh, who was this Indian guy, and I had no idea who he was, and he was telling me about how he was coaching his daughter's, 12-year-old uh, daughter's basketball team, even though he knew nothing about basketball. He was, after all, Indian. And he, uh, and he also pointed out that his daughter was on a team. There were all these Silicon Valley, daughters of Silicon Valley guys. And without casting any aspersions about Silicon Valley people, one can imagine what their, what kind of level of athletic ability their children would have. Um, so here he was, a guy who knew nothing about basketball, coaching a team of people who knew nothing about how to play basketball. And so he went and studied American basketball and was like, it made no sense to me. And so he decided that uh, what, didn't, what he didn't understand was that he didn't understand why if the object of the game was to prevent the other team from scoring, why do teams run back into their own end and essentially invite the other team to bring the ball up? Yeah. Why wouldn't you... He didn't understand why he didn't full court press every minute all of the, the game. Time. All the time. Yeah. So he did that with his team. And he basically told them, it's pointless for me to teach you how to dribble or shoot or pass because I don't know how to do that in two. It's too late, you, you know, you're, you don't know how to do it. Uh, <laughs> so he, he just had them just run around like this for the whole game. And they, was, they started to win games like six nothing. Um, and they ended up going all the way to the national championship. And I, he told me that story just years ago. I just thought it was hilarious. And then I didn't do anything with it, of course, because yeah. I'm an idiot. And then I told this to a friend of mine. He was like, why haven't you written that up? So I wrote it up and then blah, blah, blah. Now, the punchline is the guy's name was Vivek, Vivek Ranadiv. He is now the owner of the Sacramento, Sacramento Kings. Sacramento Kings, yeah. Um, so <laughs> he's a strange, a really fun, interesting guy. But I remember the first time I went to see him and I walked in his office. So here's a guy running a multi-billion dollar, highly successful enterprise software firm in Silicon Valley. So you have a set of expectations about what's going to happen when you walk in his office. Mm -hmm. So I walk in his office and I look and I see, you know who's sitting there next to him just chatting away? Roger Craig. Remember Roger Craig? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's like, what's Roger Craig doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was very, anyway, you have to know who Roger Craig was. He was a 
running back for the yeah. San Francisco 49ers. And I remember even earlier the pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, another Roger Craig. Oh, right, yes. A long time ago. Yes. I, I, odd, odd I'm trivia. nodding like I remember <laughs> Brooklyn Dodgers, which I don't. But. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm older. I mean, is this how it works often in books? You kind of save string with specifics and then you see that there's a larger thing that they could go to? Or do you get the larger thing first and then you kind of root around and see what you can find? Well, uh, you get interested in things and then you realize, like, outliers began because I had a friend who, uh, whose dad was the, was the Wachtell in Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Kratz, uh -huh. Kratz, Katz, the arguably the greatest law firm in the world. <clears throat> and she told me the story once about how her dad, not only did Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Kratz all have the exact same background. They were all born in the mid-1930s, children of garment workers, grew up in the Bronx, went to City College, and then NYU, back when NYU was a commuter school. Um, but also randomly, like in her dad's kindergarten, like, the guys he made friends with all turned out to be these, to go on to amazing things. And I just was so struck by this notion that a, uh, sort of led me to think about, well, why did, um, that this was a wonderful way of explaining how uh, success happens, right? That, and it was also wonderfully paradoxical because it's not what you would have expected as the background for a group of people who end up being to dominate the, American legal establishment. Um, and just sort of understanding the connections and understanding that that was not a coincidence, but actually there may have been, was really kind of, and once I got going on that, that sort of led to a led lot to of other things. Other things. Yeah, no, and the one, the idea, you know, of David and Goliath, I mean, again, when I read it, I thought of this wonderful quote I had read from Kirk Douglas in his autobiography where he says, my children do not have the advantage of poverty. You yes. Know. And it's, again, the idea that we're not really sure what an advantage is and what a disadvantage is. And, you know, yeah. can you tell us Well, something? actually, it was funny because that idea, I would talk to these, so I ended up interviewing for outliers dozens of Jewish lawyers of that generation. Because, you know, you get obsessed and you, they're really <laughs> interesting. And so you, you're like, why, why stop at 10? Why not interview 25 of them? So I ended up, and they all know, like, so you ask them, you say, well, here's what I'm, when you, after you've sort of gotten friendly with them, you say, well, look, I'm interested in people like yourself who are top lawyers in New York who were born around 1935 and grew up in the Bronx to the children of garment workers. Do you know any? And of course, they're like, oh, I mean, I know 30 guys who fit that description. <laughs> so you can do this forever. Yeah. So I would do this forever. And I would talk to these guys. <laughs> And they would always say the same thing. After going on for two hours about what an amazing thing it was to have grown up in sort of semi-poverty in the Bronx and have gone to City College and NYU when it was a bad school, they would then tell you that they did everything in their power to make sure their kids went to, you know, Harvard That's, or Yale. Yeah. And you were like, you wanted to question them about the paradox. Well, like, if it was such a good thing for you to have gone to NYU when it was a bad school, why aren't you sending your kids yeah. to a bad school? Like, why, why do you think the same thing, the same rules that made you a success don't apply to your kids? Well, did you ask them? Well, you are dealing with pretty ferocious <laughs> litigators. I mean, <laughs> you want to be careful about just how... And also, it doesn't occur to you at the time because that's what people do, right? It's always, you know this, it's always yeah. the case when yeah. you're conducting an interview that the best questions are the ones you think of yes, think up on the way home. On the way home, exactly. So on the way yeah. home, I would say to myself, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Why does he think it, the rules yeah, are different? Yeah. So then, um, <clears throat> so that was sort of the seed of, of when I was thinking about yeah. um, uh, David and Goliath. And also, in a kind of masochistic way, I was attracted by the notion that, I was sort of that my own success was in, was in fact destroying me. Huh. I thought that was kind of a cool concept. Do you still feel that? <laughs> do I still feel that? I do in a certain way. I think it affects you in... Uh, I think, you, I think it becomes very hard to be a good person after a certain point. Huh. Uh, um, you have to be very, or at least it's, it's not impossible, it's just harder work. Um, and you have to be, con just as, you know, in that bit in David and when I talk about what it means to be, how hard it is, weirdly, to be a parent, to be a wealthy parent. How much more difficult it is to raise a child well if you're, 
very wealthy as opposed to in the middle class. It's not impossible, but it requires more of you. So there's that whole thing I have about mm. um, the difference between can't and won't. Um, mm. That saying no to a child when you're middle class is very easy because you just say, we can't. Yeah. You want a pony? Look around you. Yeah. Where's the pony? <laughs> <laughs> where, where would the pony go? In this? <laughs> Do you look in your bedroom? Yeah. Is there a room yeah. for a stable? Yeah. But of course, if you're a... If you're a billionaire, you can't use can't anymore. You yeah. have to use won't, and won't is really hard. Yeah. Won't yeah. requires you to give an explanation, right? Beyond a kind of flippant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in the same way, I think when you get, uh, when, you're, when you're living a kind of normal life, um, being, uh, being empathetic uh, comes naturally. And when you're successful, it, you have to work to be yeah. empathetic. Yeah. Um, and that um, is something that I have become, um, to me, the two, the two projects of being a writer, and the two reasons why I was drawn to it, is that writing is a constant lesson in empathy and in listening. And they're linked, of course, yeah, but they're yeah, sort of yeah. separate. It forces you to do those, two, which I think of as the two hardest things um, that any human being is called being, to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, not the two hardest, but, but among the hardest. They're tough. Um, and so writing forces you to do that over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And um, both of those things become harder as you become more successful. Right? Yeah. yeah. Huh. What uh, the research you do versus the writing? I mean, do you love the research? Do you love them both equally? Which parts of the, the journalist job do you like the most, or are they equal for you? Well, there's a moment when you're doing a story when you realize it's a great story and there's almost nothing that beats that moment and that's long before you've written it yeah yeah so writing is often anticlimactic um mm -hmm. uh and that's so I, I suppose it's that kind of um that that discovery of something like i read <laughs> i just did a book review for the new yorker because i read this book and i don't even know why i read it but it it's by this guy it has that quality of all kind of second tier memoirs which is that Midway through the second tier memoir, you always get the feeling that the memoirist has forgotten that people are going to be reading the book. Or maybe <laughs> they have no expectation that anyone's going to read the book. But like, they lose all self-consciousness. Yeah, yeah. And they just start telling you about their life. And you're like, I can't believe you're sharing that with the world. So I read this book, which had this precise quality. It was so unbelievable. It's by a guy who was a DEA a big guy in the DEA, huh. and he ran undercover operations for years, and he ends up as the top DEA guy in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, of course, is the source of 80% of the world's heroin. So like in the DEA world, that's like, you know, that's as good as it gets. Yeah. So he writes his memoirs, and he, halfway through, you realize he just he has wandered into this kind of cocoon where he's just kind of writing for himself and, uh, and there's no censor anymore and he has no idea about how he sounds. And if you're reading a book with the eye to write about it and you hit that moment, yeah. you're like, oh okay. my God, this is, <laughs> this is fantastic. I mean, not because you don't want to, it's not because it's humil, you don't want to humiliate him or you, have, well, it's just that it's so rare that people just let, completely let their guard yeah, down in that kind way. kind of candor right? it's there. It's just yeah. magical. Like he has this thing where the whole last third of the book, if you want to read it, you should, <laughs> but I'll, I'm ruining There's a spoiler alert here. <laughs> the whole last third of the book is all about how he essentially falls in love. The whole, let me backtrack. He's an, <laughs> he's an, in, he's an undercover yeah. guy. He does spend his whole life in undercover. Yeah. There is a rich literature psychological literature on what it means to be an undercover agent. And uh, it is not dissimilar from what it means to be um, a, a method actor. Uh -huh. They call it deep yeah. acting, is yeah. the psychological yeah. term. And there are all kinds of psychological consequences to deep acting, to completely taking on someone else's persona. And one of the ways that you uh, justify what you're doing to yourself uh, uh, as you are in undercover or acting is that the persona you have taken on or the world that you have entered 
you begin to give it um, uh, a, a moral weight that, an, that, it, that, that it might not otherwise have. No. Uh, you become sympathetic to it. The characters who you're dealing with no longer become, you, you aggrandize them in your mind. They become towering figures, amoral <laughs> geniuses, this kind of thing. It's just like a Stockholm you, syndrome kind of thing? A little bit, yeah. yeah. So you become, if you spend your life in undercover, after a while you come to believe that the heroin traffickers that you spend your time with are these kind of giants of men who, you know, were they not heroin traffickers would be running GE and you no know, solving. And he does this, and it's like, you watch over the course of the book as he gets deeper and deeper and deeper, that he's just completely, so by the time he gets to Afghanistan at the end of his career, he has a relationship, and I use that word in the romantic sense. He, he's not having a sexual relationship, but it's romantic in the sense, he hangs out with this guy who's the biggest heroin trafficker in the world, this guy called HJK, who is like friends with Osama bin Laden, giving hundreds of millions of dollars to the, to, uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And he's an inf DEA informant, and this guy falls in love with him. And they hang out and have dinner, and they you know, pray together in the mosque. And he has these passages near the end where he, he remembers... HJK is like 6'4", 250, and this, this guy who wrote the book is this little guy. And he would like give him, he would remember HJK enveloping him in his arms and the bristle of HJK's beard against his <laughs> cheek and the warmth of his kiss. And just like, you're like, this guy's work, I mean, is this what the DEA is full of? That's, that's your question. <clears throat> the drug war is being conducted by these guys who have just gone over to the other side, right? Anyway, it's just sort of, that kind of stuff is it's just kind of great. Yeah. Well, I can almost know the answer to this without asking you. I assume you do all your own research. You see, clearly, you love it so much. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. Okay, except that uh, my problem is I'm a bad interviewer. Um, not because I find it really, really hard, and I run out of energy. And unless I can come back, and I can't always, can't always do that, um, I often don't get as much out of the interviewer. So sometimes there are very specific instances where I realize going in that I'm not the guy for the task. Huh. And so I will, on a handful of occasions, I have recruited people to interview people for me because I think, um, so for example, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, David and Goliath, the, well, I don't know why I would tell the world. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> From time to time. This is happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, uh, actually, one of the things that intrigued me was that I read that you have no patience for Google. Google is something you don't like. At least I've read that. Is this a true story? Well, no, I've evolved from that position. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, sound, it makes me sound like a serious Luddite. It's like... <laughs> And I don't like electric lights, and I don't like... Um, <laughs> no, I've come to understand that Google is my friend, in the sense that uh, it has led a generation of journalists to believe that everything they want can be found on Google. Yeah. So those of us who still go to the library have a competitive advantage now. Yeah. Used to be we all went to the library, and so if yeah. you went to the library, you were just another ordinary schmo. Now it's like just me in there. So yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have time to read for pleasure? Like when you're just, you know? I do, yes. What, and what do you read when you do this? <laughs> I, well, I, I just read, uh, uh, a, I just finished last night, uh, A Deniable Death by Gerald Seymour. Do you ever read any Gerald Seymour? I know who he is, but he I doesn't, haven't, yeah. He's not in, you go to an American bookstore, there are no Gerald Seymour mm -hmm. books, which is, first of all, he's written this many, and secondly, he's fantastic. Yeah. Um, he's just sort of, I guess he's like an English acquired taste. He writes English, he writes these sort of literary military thrillers um, that are really long, and <laughs> they're, they're, we're, they're, they're really kind of gripping. Um, and they're always about, they always end up being about the kind of strange nobility of, the, of a kind of uh, lower middle class English, you know, journeyman from Yorkshire. It's like, that's his thing, and I find that it's, I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> I'll have to read one. I'll have to read one. What, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, you know, so many of the people in your books leave a really strong impression. You think about them even years later. I, the one I wrote down was Chris Langan, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the world's, one of the smartest person in the world who 
had a very, a life that you would not think. Who stays in your mind of the people you've written about like that? Who are the characters that you kind of think about still? Uh, well, uh, in David and Goliath, the guy, uh, Emil Freireich, uh, the sure. cancer researcher I wrote oh, about. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, who I really, I mean, I, I feel like it's one of those instances, remember when I said I thought that writing is about listening and empathy? Um, he, I called him, I, I knew about it because I was doing another story entirely and I called him for just some small thing. And he's like, so for those of you who haven't read the book, this is this guy who is essentially, he's one of, there's a group of people, but he's the lead guy in the group that cures childhood leukemia and basically creates the paradigm for the successful treatment of a number of cancers through chemotherapy. Um, does this all at NIH in the NCI in the late 60s, early 70s. So he's like in his 80s, I call him up on the story, and I thought he was the most uh, obnoxious person I'd ever talked to in my life. <laughs> and I, I just, it was one of those things where I, I, I didn't want to talk to him, I wanted to get off the phone as quickly as possible. He just was like being sort of hateful and weird and blah, blah, blah. And then I hung up and then I thought, well, there was a reason I called him because he's supposed to be an expert, so I'll look again and see what he did. And I sort of began to read about him and I realized that, that I, wanted to, I wanted to go and see him again and talk to him in more detail about what he had done because I was sort of curious. And I went down to Houston to see him and the same thing happened. The first hour was incredibly difficult. And then I began to realize that the thing that made his research possible and his obnoxious personality were the same. Huh. That you couldn't separate his genius from his... That he, so when I, when I understood that in the years when he was putting forth this idea of, basically he was the guy behind combination chemotherapy. You take the kid who's this big and is dying, has three weeks to live, and everyone else has give, given up on and has a 100% mortality rate and is living in a ward in a hospital and bleeding uncontrollably from every orifice such that there is blood on the walls and on the ceiling and the nurses come out at the end of the night and their whole uh, out, uh, uniforms are red wow. and the doctors won't go in because it's so depressing. Like, yeah. that's the scene. And everyone has given up on these children. And here's a guy who decides at the age of 27, or 28, that he is going to do what everyone else thinks is impossible, which is solve this disease. And he sets out a strategy that is so bizarre and out of the ordinary that everyone in, the, in his entire world denounces him, tries to drive him out of NCI, call, heckles him at meetings, calls him a Nazi doctor. I mean, he puts up with the most unspeakable level of, and all the while he is going into these wards every day and no one will help him and he's conducting medical trials by himself wow. on these kids, right? And how do you do that? You do that if you are someone who is like that, in, indomitable. Yeah. You know your own, you could care less what anyone thinks about you. You say what's on your mind. You, you never worry for a moment that you're going to offend someone. You're, that's just who we, and you, yeah. you can't have one without the other, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 And until I, I realized that until I understood that, I, I had... Um, uh, I had, what had I done? I had, I, it was a moral failing on my part, right? I had judged him way too premature, premature, yeah. uh, prematurely. And I also, um, I, had, I had failed at my task as a writer and as a human being to understand him, huh. right? Yeah, um, yeah. And that's like, uh, it made me realize you can't... Um, I feel the whole process of my writing career has been a, an exercise in delaying the moment uh, at which I draw a conclusion about something. Huh, that's interesting. And that yeah. was another, there's a series of sort of milestones in that, but that was one where, um, uh, where I, I, um, I'm ashamed huh. of how I thought about him in the beginning. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, one of the things I hear from people who are interviewed a lot is that they hate it when they can tell when a journalist comes in and has the story in their head already, has an agenda for the questions, and that that makes people crazy. Yeah, but that's I mean, a, correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
I wanted to ask you about the, uh, since we're in California, one of the sections that really fascinated me in the David and Goliath book is about three strikes. Yeah. The three strikes law, which is, you know, one of the products of our state. And uh, mm -hmm. talk about, you know, I mean, it's a very interesting, the whole progression of that chapter is very interesting. You start with the man who's kind of was the force behind it, and then it gradually unravels. You know, is this how your thinking worked on it? Or did you, how did, I mean, I'm just curious how you put that section together in terms of reporting yeah. it. Uh, three strikes, uh, you know, history will look back on the three strikes era in California as uh, the darkest uh, era in the state's history. Huh. I, I feel, I have no doubt that that is gonna be true. Um, what happened in this, between 93 and two years ago was an abomination, absolutely an abomination. When you have in, had in the state of California an incarceration rate that was seven times the incarceration rate of Canada or Western Europe. You're dealing with, I mean, <clears throat> uh, it's like you have to go in the 20th century to Stalin's Russia to find a place where more people were in jail. Wow. I mean, it's sort of, it's unbelievable it was allowed to happen. So I, I wanted to write about it, and I wanted to, and the thing that interested me about it was that things like that happen from the best of intentions, not the worst of intentions, yeah. right? It's not that a bunch of really, really evil people set out to ruin as many lives as possible and squander as many billions of dollars as they could yeah. in as short a period of time as they could, which <laughs> that does happen, by the way, yeah. in America. But <laughs> in this particular instance, I thought it wasn't the case. Um, but no, but then an understanding that the root of it was a man who lost his daughter, right? And who... This was an expression of his grief. Um, and that, all of a sudden, when you understand that, um, the whole kind of, uh, the story deepens in a, um, in a really kind of profound and moving way. Um, so I met with this guy, and it was one of the hardest um, Mike Reynolds, who was, whose daughter was murdered in 92, and then he starts the crusade for three strikes, and it, three strikes wins. I mean. Um, and it was, the interview I had with him was one of the m most difficult I've ever had. I mean, it was incredibly painful that he, he still carried all of that anger and grief with him. And in the expression of something good, which was he wanted to make sure this never happened to anyone else. Yeah, yeah. He committed some, he, di he, he, he did something that was wrong, right? That ended up and that had no appreciable effect on California's crime rate. In fact, there are many people who believe that California's crime rate would have been lower in the absence of three strikes. Um, and in the meantime, countless families, communities, individuals had their lives destroyed by a, a set of law, by, a, an, an, by an unspeakably punitive set of laws. Um, and then I, so then I got very interested in, well, did he have an alternative? And so I was led to the story of this uh, Wilma Dirksen, this woman in Canada, who exactly the same thing happened to. She'd lost her daughter in, in an unspeakable crime. And she did the opposite thing. She chose to forgive. Um, and just going back and forth between the two of them, um, it, was in, it, was, it, it, was in, it was incredibly sort of mm. um, moving and, uh, and realizing that she was the courageous one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that how infinitely harder it is. I mean, she stood up the week after, she and her husband, the week after their daughter, before they'd even found the murderer, after yeah. their daughter was found dead, and said, whoever murdered my daughter, we forgive him. Jesus. Yeah, right? yeah. It's it kind of amazing to read. Yeah. yeah. In general, you know, I mean, I think, I, going through all the, I mean, is it fair to say one of the things I feel about your writing that's so pleasurable is that it's kind of counterintuitive. It's kind of often saying everything you believe is wrong, you know, but in a way that's very pleasant, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if that doesn't sound weird, you know. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I didn't know. You know, it's kind of more, I mean, do you see yourself as kind of fighting against conventional wisdom or does it just work out that way? Well, I, I have noticed that, um, uh, when my books receive hostile reviews, often one set of hostile reviews accuses me of 
saying things so counterintuitive they can't possibly be true. Mm -hmm. And the other set of hostile reviews accuses me of saying things so obvious that it can't possibly be worth, be worth <laughs> reading about. <laughs> and sometimes I'll be accused of both things simultaneously, which has always struck me as um, a kind of extraordinary feat, if true. Uh, but um, I don't, am I a counterintuitive? Well, I'm only counterintuitive in the sense that I have always believed, and I think anyone who is a thinking person believes, that the more you learn about something, the more likely it is for your mind to change. Yes. Right? Knowledge only rarely confirms what you thought you already knew. Most of the time, digging into something yeah. can make, just makes you realize how dumb yeah. you were before. Well, you kind of say, yeah, I had um, no idea, kind of, you yeah, say. The yeah, kind of, um, yeah. and I, um, I'm often, I, I locate the source of this. I love nothing more than telling stories about my father. Uh, <laughs> I like, locate the source of this in my father, who's, who divides the world into two categories. On the one hand, those who know more about a subject than he does. And on the other hand, those who know less about a subject than he does. And since he only knows about two subjects, <laughs> <laughs> mathematics and gardening, basically his position is the rest of the world knows better. And so you, in any given situation, merely by asserting a fact that he, and in a, you know, on a position other than gardening or mathematics, <laughs> you can win him over. He'll be like, okay, that's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> he wants, my favorite story about this is, years ago, when I was a little kid, driving a car, somehow the subject of homosexuality came up, and my father said, and I asked because I was curious what it was. I was like eight. My father said, well, you know, some people make the choice to, you know, have a relationship with someone of the same sex. And my mom said, no, no, Graham, they don't make a choice, they're born that way. And my father says to me, homosexuality is people are born a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> like, so multiply that times a thousand and you have my childhood. And is there something insanely liberating about that? So it's like, my, you know, and it doesn't even bother him for a moment that he did a U-turn. <laughs> like he's got no... And I think we should all aspire. I've often wondered what, uh, what would presidential debates look like if they were... <laughs> if it was basically versions of my dad. So they'd be all be saying, like, that's, wait, that's really good point. I, <laughs> I had no idea. Um, <laughs> Wait, lowering taxes on the rich is not a good idea? Oh, why didn't someone tell me? I could have had a V8, you know, one of those moments. I wanted to ask you actually about your childhood, which sounds like it was different in some ways. I mean, didn't, you know, I, want you, I don't want to tell about it, I want you to talk about it, but I have a quote that says, my eclecticism and curiosity is due in part to my upbringing. So I... Well, I was bored my entire childhood. Um, my uh, parents uh, felt no compunction at any time um, to amuse me. Um, <laughs> so, Some things or, have changed. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was, um, which I was sort of into at the time. I thought this was a very good idea. But it just never, they were of that generation. They were like, you know, you've got a brain, a bicycle, uh, a library card. What more do you want? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, I would constantly, and whenever I told my mother I was bored, my mother would always say, that's a good thing. You're giving your brain a rest. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, I don't know how many times that said, for example, on the west side of LA. But, um, <laughs> but uh, she, <clears throat> so I was encouraged to kind of, you know, um, make stuff up and uh, go off on my own. Mm. And, um, uh, so I think that was a good, uh, yeah. that, was, that was a good thing. But you had, is it true that you had no TV, none of these we things? Had no, no television. We had no, uh, we had a record player, but no records. We, <laughs> we would go, my, fa my parents would go to the library and borrow records, but they would only ever, their sort of imagination would run out after sort of Simon and Garfunkel. So I, know, I knew Simon and Garfunkel really well. And um, we never went out to eat as well. Um, we lived out in the country. Um, so I was really a kind of prisoner of, <laughs> of my parents' house. And I had, um, 
But I had two friends who, who, uh, yes, right about them. who yeah. remain my best friends today. So. And have also done, you know, gone out in the world and... Yes, I, I, I saw my friend. So I grew up with these two guys, um, one of whom, one of the guys, name was Terry, and Terry was, his parents, no, my parents. Uh, Terry, dad, was in the uh, chicken feed business. And neither of his parents had gone, had graduated from high school. And Terry, uh, as far as I knew, until I had met him, had never read a book. He was one of those kinds of guys. Mm. He's now a uh, professor of history at Harvard, but that's a long, <laughs> a long story. But um, Terry uh, was an incredibly uh, uh, interesting and subversive uh, force in my childhood. But I was with him the other day, and we were discussing, I just saw him two days ago, and uh, we were discussing this fact that he now lives in Belmont, outside of Cambridge, wow. and goes to a school where, which could not be more different from the school we went to. So we went to a school where maybe there were 10 kids in the school whose parents had gone to college. Wow. Um, so it was, you know, for a large portion of my uh, middle schooling and elementary school, we weren't actually, me, Terry, and my friend Bruce, we weren't actually educated. They simply sent us to the library. They were like, <laughs> just... Um, <laughs> and so now he sends his kids to the school where everyone's a genius. Yeah. And so we had this discussion about the which thing I talked about, about in before. my book, which is yeah. that he has a son who is every bit as smart as Terry is, but doesn't realize he's smart because he's in the 70th percentile in a class full of essentially little Albert Einstein's. Yeah. Um, whereas we were, I mean, it was me and Terry and my friend Bruce, and that was it, <laughs> right? How hard is that? We, we thought we were, we used to have these long discussions when I was a kid with my, these two friends of mine. We didn't know what the rest of the world was like. We were like, we didn't know if you went to another high school, because we didn't even know people from other high schools. Were they, did they read books? Were they... Did they know about the world? Did they? We had no way of wow. measuring. So it was like this, we were in this kind of little bubble where, but it was, by the way, fantastic. Yeah, no, it sounds great. It sounds great. What, one of the things you, you write about aligned with this, I mean, about being a, uh, being a Canadian, what impact that had in, in your work and how you do things. And one of the things that I noticed was that you wrote you were incapable of doom and gloom, uh, you know, that it's made you a more optimistic person. Is, yeah. that, is that true? Well, <clears throat> yes, uh, in the sense that Canada, um, there is no, Canada is essentially uh, a non-neurotic form of the United States. So <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't understand how like, everything in this country is just like such a production and there's so much anxiety and it just, you go to Canada, and you, the minute you cross the border, you just, you just feel this great weight is taken off your <laughs> Nothing seems to, you know, like, so for example, returning to questions of my childhood, uh, I never graduated from high school. Wow. But no one seemed to think this was a big deal. <laughs> it just never, I just basically informed my parents, and many people did this, but like, it just wasn't, I just wasn't in taking that many courses, and so we just went to the, the university. You know how you, you know how you apply to, in my era, apply to university in Canada? You would get a sheet of paper from the government, and it would list all of the colleges in Ontario, and you would just put, you just number them in order of preference, and mail the paper, a piece of paper. Wow, that was, that it. was it. That was it. Wow. And your school would send in your <laughs> grades, and then you never, there was no standardized testing, and yeah. so like, Imagine a world where that's the uh, whole high-stakes college choice thing, which, <laughs> as far as I can tell, consumes the last decade of people's public schooling in this country. It was, I did it in an afternoon. And then, um, so, like, you start adding up all these things, it's just not, there's just not that much stress. Um, we've never had, parenthetically in Canada, you know that we've never had a banking crisis? We didn't even know. You guys have them every 12 years. Everyone's worried. We never had one. We don't even know what that is, right? So it's, uh, yeah, very hard to be, to be kind of, you know, there, you know, you'll notice that Canadian, there's no such thing as, just, 
you know, how Swedish films are always sort of... Angst. Yeah, there's, there's no equivalent body of work in the <laughs> Canadian film industry. It's usually about, like, young boys playing hockey. And, like... <laughs> I want to ask you, I mean, because again, in addition to the research, I mean, you have a, if I say so, a really wonderful writing style. You know, it's clean, it's propulsive. There's a wonderful quote I read from someone that when you finish reading one of your books, you end up thinking briefly that you might be as clever as he is, you know. Oh, <laughs> I thought that was a great line. I mean, do you, is this, do you work hard at this? I mean, I think things that look effortless often involve, especially when writing's yeah. concerned, a lot of work. I mean, is this... Well, I pretend I don't look hard. That's the <laughs> key thing. Um, no, I, uh, my, my mother is a writer, and uh, a very beautiful writer, and I very consciously modeled my writing after hers from a very early age, and she uh, is a, a great fan of clarity and simplicity. She, and that sort of was always drilled into me that there was no reason, there's no earthly reason to be complicated unless you absolutely have to be. No. Um, and uh, my, uh, <laughs> my uh, this was a constant topic of conversation. Because we were, we weren't, we were living in Canada, we weren't Canadians. We were, um, my f mother is Jamaican, my father is English, and we came to Canada when I was six. And <clears throat> my parents' relationship to their new country was, in some sense, oppositional. So they loved nothing more than to point out ways in which Canadians failed to live up to their own standards. So, for example, my father's big thing about Canadians is that he was obsessed with the notion that they were lazy. And he would conduct experiments. So we lived, this is totally a tangent, but this is one of my favorite things my dad ever did. We lived on a, on a highway. And so there was a series of houses, starting with ours, that stretched for a mile. And there was just the highway and there's nothing behind, just farmland behind. So my father decided, and his theory was the Canadians were super lazy. They would never walk when they could drive. So what he did is he held a party once and he invited everyone from our house all the way down to the end of the mile. And then we made bets on how many houses away would you have to be before you drove. And his, his whole thing was the only person, people who are going to walk are the people who are in the first house and the second house. Everyone else is driving. We we're like, no, 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 no. He won. They all drove. So that was like a huge moment. And for that night, I was like, oh, Canadians are so lazy. My mother's big thing is that Canadians were, um, she didn't like, she felt they were uh, excessively wordy. Huh. And she was constantly harping on um, how they were, like for example, <laughs> to this day, if you use the phrase highest priority around my mother, her, it's the only thing that'll get her upset. <laughs> it's the only, she'd be like, it's a priority. How can it be the highest if something that's already a priority? What is the matter with you? <laughs> like, calm down. <laughs> My point is, this actually yeah. answers your question. Yes. So, two role models. Yes. One saying that laziness is the worst possible yeah. you know, sin, and the other saying wordiness is the most possible. Yeah. So what do you have? Someone who does endless rewrites of trying to simplify his writing. Yeah. That's, I am the perfect <laughs> amalgam of my parents' two primary... Well, it worked. It worked. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, one of the things I want to ask about is the, this may be an odd thing, but it struck me looking through all the books, kind of the uniform topography. I mean, they all look the same. I mean, yeah. I, this is a good thing. You know, I like the way they look. And also this, I mean, I was actually reminded of Edward Gibbon, all these footnotes where these fascinating things are in it, asterisks and little arrows. I mean, is this stuff that you, uh, is this your idea? And well, what, I recently, over the course of writing, there are more footnotes. Each book has more footnotes yeah. than in the last because I'm really, I've really gotten into them. And, uh, and I realize I'm a footnote reader, so I will sometimes read academic articles and start just by reading the footnotes. Because yeah. <laughs> invariably the interesting stuff is always there. It's like, yeah. whoa, you know? <laughs> people settle scores, they, you know, and also they tell you, but more importantly, they tell you how they reach their conclusions there, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's, uh, and so that got me really excited. Um, about footnotes as a kind of, um, and then Grant, I, don't, I'm, I love this sports website, Grantland, and Grantland uses, because Bill Simmons, who runs Grantland, he wrote a book, um, this called The Book of Basketball, which has more footnotes than it has 
text, practically. <laughs> um, it's like a law review article. And the footnotes are fantastic. And just made me realize, it's just sort of fun. And Dave Eggers used to do the same yeah, thing, yeah, right? Absolutely, um, yeah. It's just another, it's a way of being parenthetical. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I just think it's, um, it feeds to the idea that all of these books are supposed to, are based on the premise that the exploration of complicated ideas is fun. I mean, it, unless it's, the whole process is fun, there's no point doing it. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to entertain you, yeah, yeah. the reader. So the footnotes are, um, are, are part of that. Yeah, no, I think they're fun. I remember, as, you know, as a kid, finding them in Gibbon, you know, in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, where all these amazing things about the awful stuff the emperors would do are kind of relegated to footnotes. Right, yeah. <laughs> now, you give a lot, of, a lot of talks in places in addition to writing books. And I just had a question. First of all, what's the most unusual place you've ever given a talk? Oh, wow. Well. Uh, Does anything pop? If nothing pops to mind, that's okay. Yeah, I'll think about that. <laughs> okay. And, you know, I was interested that you, you have on your website this really fascinating piece about why you give talks. Uh, yeah. And I just wondered why you went to all the trouble to write that piece. It's really long, isn't it? It's yeah, like I was, yeah, it is very long. Words. But it's fascinating. I mean, I thought it was a great piece. But yeah. I said, boy, this is interesting. I got in trouble once. And I can't even remember what I got in trouble for. But I got in trouble because there was a perception that I had given a talk and written an article and there was a conflict of interest between the two uh -huh. of them. And uh, it wasn't wrong. Uh, and so I decided that I should really explain, uh, I should sort of navigate this territory. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it was like all those cases, you know, once you get rolling, um, then it gets really <laughs> kind of fun to think about yeah. what it means to be... Um, and it was written a long time. It's like 10 years old now. But uh, people, every now and again... Um, uh, but I think it's still largely relevant. The thing that... The crucial thing to understand about talks is that talks are a mechanism... If you are an introvert, as I am, you have to get out in the world, and you have to force yourself to get out in the world. Um, and unless you get out in the world, you won't find anything. Huh. And talks... What talks do is someone line, you know, you go and there's a random, you get to meet a random set of people in a random group of circumstances. And that's incredibly valuable because you, like when I ran into Vivek Ranadiv at yeah, that conference, yeah, yeah. that was a talk. And I meet a guy and that turns out to be the, uh, the basis for one of my books. That happens a lot. Um, and people, what's useful about, what's people are at their most interesting when they're not trying to be interesting. Um, mostly it's because all of us, and I, 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 I include myself in this, our own sense of what we think is interesting about us, about ourselves, is not what's interesting about ourselves, right? We're, we're hopelessly deluded on this, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so you, when you get people, when you meet people and talk to them about what they do in a non-formal setting, you get that glimpse into their they're not yeah. performing for yeah, you, yeah. right? And that's incredibly valuable. You, yeah. you hear all this kind of, um, uh, uh, you just hear, you just get a, I don't know, you, there's, there's something about them that's, that's it's, like, it's like that moment in the memoir of the DEA guy yeah. when he suddenly forgets that it's going to be read by the public. Yeah. That, <laughs> the, the onset of unselfconsciousness yeah. is the sweet spot for any... Um, yeah. no, that's, that's what you get that, when you go yeah. on the road. Uh, that's what you're looking for, you know, as a journalist, for sure. Are you working on anything now that you uh, can tell us about? Uh, a couple of things. Um, I, uh, I just finished a long piece. I finished the piece about the DEA guy. Um, and then I also finished a piece for The New Yorker, which will run uh, in two weeks. In, I wanted to write about cars, they're like mm -hmm. cars. And I got really interested in the, all the recalls of last year, yeah. the Chevy yeah. Cobalt ignition switch. And I wanted to write about that, but then I did all these interviews and I did, wasn't really getting anywhere. Um, and, uh, but I was struck by what a production it was. Um, and there was a kind of weird theater that surrounded these um, recalls. And so anyway, I got, I got interested in recalls. And then I was speaking to um, a friend of mine who's a psych brilliant psychologist named Adam Grant about this. And Adam sends me a paper from some obscure journal 20 years ago. And the paper is written by a guy who was the recall manager at Ford Motor Company in 1975 when the first 
incident of a Ford Pinto blowing up wow. came to the attention of Ford. And he describes, so here he is, there's a group of, I forget, four or five people in the recall office at Ford. Pintos have this problem. Many of you don't remember Pintos if you're young. Pinto was a compact made by Ford, which had this problem that if you hit it um, at a certain speed from behind, it would burst into flames. Um, <laughs> and it led to a huge amount of litigation. It was the first signature yeah. defective automobile. Um, so here's a guy in the office that's dedicated to, Ford has a field staff, every, all automakers do, of engineers, and they go and visit dealers and whatever. Whenever they hear about something strange happening to a car, they write up the report and they send it in. And they send it in to this group, and this guy was in the group. And the first time someone sent in a report of a Pinto bursting into flames, it came across his desk. So the, he wrote this paper about what happened huh. and why he chose not to, why he made the incredibly fateful decision not to recommend a recall, right? Which in retrospect, Ford ended up paying a gazillion dollars. The company was, was put on trial for murder. The company was put on trial for murder. I mean, it went on and on. It was, a, it was one of the biggest audit. Anyway, so he describes, and I just thought this was, it was incredibly interesting. So I went to see him and he teaches at Penn State and 75% of the article is simply a transcription, an annotated transcription of our interview. The rest is me sort of explaining. But it was all about how, uh, en and how engineers see the world differently from the rest of us. Huh. Um, which interests me a great deal for a number of reasons. One is that my dad is an engineer, so it was a kind of, it was like, oh, so that's why that happened. Um, <laughs> but secondly, um, it's, an, it's exercise in this thing that I love to do, which is look, when you look at the world through someone else's eyes, how different it seems. Yes. And by the end, you're, he has convinced you, I think, that he made the right decision. Huh. Not the right decision in the grand global sense, but for what he knew at the time and for where he was and yeah. for what. And I just feel like if you can convince people, if you can allow people a window into, some, into the difficulty of someone else's decision making, you've won. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's the thing that is the. the hardest for all of us to do, especially in retrospect. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, the car was killing people. He, he kept it on the road. Yeah. The guy's a what was monster. He thinking? Yeah. yeah, but in fact, he's not a monster, you yeah. know, and you realize there's a series, this is good, last tangent. <laughs> there's a whole series of things that if we truths, if we took them to heart, would completely destroy uh, the criminal justice system as we know it. Because a lot of what the criminal justice system does, it strikes me, is violate this notion, is construct scenarios after the fact that assign uh, narratives to things that happened. And it, in many ways, unless someone is very, very capably represented, it's almost impossible for the person accused of the crime to actually describe to you what they were going through. And certain kinds of narratives are unavailable to you. So I thought of this most recently. <laughs> <laughs> I am almost done. I thought of this most recently in... Um, the whole thing about Ferguson. So, you know, when the cop is, when, when the grand jury does not indict the cop, and so many of us are outraged by that, right? And my first thought was, but wait a minute, I don't have an adequate, I, I don't have a position on whether he should or should have been indicted. All I know is I don't have an adequate understanding of what was going through either of their minds at that time. Yeah, yeah. And also, there are certain narratives that are unavailable, he can't use. The narrative, I was scared out of my mind, why, because I'm not a good cop, yeah. is not, a, he can't say that. And yeah. maybe that's as simple as it was. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know whether I want to indict someone because they suddenly, for the first time in their life as a police officer, are put into a situation and realize to their horror that they are completely overmatched, yeah, right? Because yeah. most cops are never in that situation. Yeah. It's so weird to be in a profession where, you're, where you don't know, you can enter into it and spend your entire life doing it without ever knowing you're capable of the task. Yeah. And that guy was in a moment where suddenly he had to be a real cop and he couldn't do it, yeah. right? I mean, I, don't, do you, I, I feel weird about sending someone like that to jail. Yeah. But anyway. anyway. Well, thank you, Malcolm. This has been wonderful. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>